most heaven West Virginia Blue Ridge Mountains Shenandoah River Life is all there Older than the trees Younger than the mountains Blowing like the breeze Country roads Take me home To the place I belong West Virginia Mountain mama Take me home Country roads Among the battleships at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, West Virginia suffered the worst damage after Arizona and Oklahoma. Japanese aircraft had repeatedly torpedoed and bombed the ship until she was set afire and sunk. Her commanding officer, Captain Mervyn S. Benian, was one of more than a hundred of her officers and men killed in the attack. Two days later, West Virginia was being lumped into the group of ships considered total wrecks. Even though sitting upright on the harbor bottom, she was a poor bet to float again. In this episode of Battle Stars, in early 1942, while planners in Washington deliberate the future of the American battleship, a handful of unsung heroes apply old-fashioned American ingenuity, daring, and elbow grease to wrench West Virginia from death's icy grip and give her a second chance to fight. A salvage division was quickly established. In January, Captain Homer Wallen, a member of the Battle Force staff and an eternal optimist, took command of the division. The good news was that the dry docks, repair ships, repair shops ashore, and almost all auxiliary vessels had escaped Japanese attention, while help in the form of special purpose ships, experienced divers, and more equipment was on its way. During the attack, Tennessee and West Virginia were moored together. West Virginia held the exposed outboard berth of Key F-6. The damage caused by torpedoes was so extensive that the exact number of hits is impossible to determine. Five, but perhaps seven, and as many as nine hits had torn open the ship's port side, knocked the armor belt askew, and blown off the rudder. Only the efforts of quick-thinking crew to counter flood prevented the ship from capsizing and allowed her to settle with a list of three degrees to port. Equally devastating was an oil fire that burned for 30 hours and became so hot it buckled deck plating above the second deck and bulkheads for three-fourths the length of the ship. A 15-inch armor-piercing bomb had also penetrated the top of turret number three and another the foretop, but neither had exploded. Finally, minor hull damage to the starboard side occurred when she was pinched tightly against the forward key in Tennessee. After the smoke had cleared, the prevailing advice was to strip West Virginia of anything usable. First to go was most of the crew, who were needed elsewhere. Several of her five-inch guns became shore batteries. But after divers spent two weeks in the dangerous work of inspecting the ship's underwater condition, not everyone was ready to close the book on West Virginia. The damage was bad, to be sure, but perhaps not as bad as had been feared. Even so, early in 1942, Weavy, as sailors called her, was viewed mostly as a source for parts and equipment. The detailed inspection determined that she could not be raised without installing cofferdam patches over the torpedo damage. Fortunately, the Pacific Bridge Company, which was building dry docks at Pearl Harbor, quickly adapted their practices and experience to salvage, building custom sectional patches 50 feet high and 13 and a half feet wide for West Virginia. These patches, which covered virtually the entire hull amidships, extended vertically from the turn of the bilge to well above the waterline. The patches were assembled in sections, with divers working inside and out to attach them to the ship and to each other, and were sealed at the bottom with some 650 tons of underwater concrete. After the patches were installed, the water could be pumped out. The big day for the salvage team and West Virginia's skeleton crew came on May 17th, when the ship was successfully refloated. To prepare her for dry docking, any extra weight was removed, including water, some 900,000 gallons of fuel, stores, ammunition, 
personal belongings, furniture, trash, and wreckage. Spoiled provisions, including rotting meat, was a loathsome chore. The last of some 70 bodies were recovered. Meanwhile, Carrier Yorktown, after limping home from the Battle of Coral Sea, took West Virginia's spot in dry dock number one. Though floated and lightened substantially to meet that dry dock's requirements, and with California occupying dry dock number two, West Virginia rode dangerously high in the water. Lines to shore and even to the wreck of Oklahoma were rigged, but any defect or failure in a patch threatened to flood or cause her to capsize. On June 7th, California exited dry dock number two, probably with Yorktown in mind, but the damaged carrier was lost at Midway that same day. When Enterprise and Hornet returned undamaged, Tugs finally eased West Virginia into dry dock number one on June 9th, completing her unlikely six-month journey across the yard. In the spring of 1942, Navy planners made several important decisions regarding plans that affected the future of the battleship generally, and many ships specifically. Mainly, they suspended construction on the final two Iowa-class battleships and held off starting any of the five ships of the Montana class. By law, the tonnage saved by not building one type of warship could be used to build a ship of comparable size of another type. With the rise of carrier air power and the war likely to last many years, trading fast battleships for fast carriers made sense. The U.S. also needed convoy escorts, tankers, merchant ships, and landing craft in the near term more than it needed fast battleships, which took a minimum of three years to build. All these factors explain why the Navy's chief, Admiral Ernest J. King, was eager to resurrect and modernize the old battleships with their 14- and 16-inch guns. West Virginia left dry dock in September 1942. Work continued pierside until April 1943, when she departed for Puget Sound Navy Yard for reconstruction. She didn't leave until July 1944. West Virginia went into action four months later. On the night of October 24th and 25th, she led Admiral Oldendorf's battle line into action against Admiral Nishimura's old battleships in the Battle of Surigao Strait. Equipped with the highly effective Mark 8 fire control radar, the totally rebuilt versions of West Virginia, California, and Tennessee did most of the shooting. West Virginia opened fire first, pouring 93 16-inch shells into the enemy battle line. When Weavey's first salvo struck battleship Yamashiro, her gunnery officer was overheard chuckling to himself. The second salvo hit too. Soon the radar pip representing Yamashiro began to shrink until it disappeared altogether. Back in the war, West Virginia remained active in the Pacific Campaign, until when, on September 2, 1945, she led a contingent of the old battleships into Tokyo Bay for Japan's formal surrender. Country.